Good morning, and welcome to the Nobel Prize Dialogue. My name is Adam Smith, and I have the great honor to be your guide to today's meeting. As you'll see from your programs, we have a very full day, and we have a really fantastic collection of speakers and panelists, and I think I can promise you an exciting and highly stimulating day. It's also really wonderful to see such a big audience, and I want to thank you all for getting up quite early on a Sunday morning to be here. Now, the day begins with a 20-minute opening ceremony, and I will return after that. But in the meantime, I would like to leave you in the hands of my co-host, Ms. Hashimoto, who will guide you through the next 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Now we shall now begin the opening ceremony. First, Dr. Yuichiro Anzai, President of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, as a representative of the co-organizer, will offer his opening remarks on behalf of the Society. Dr. Anzai, please. Mr. Hakun Shimomura, Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, and Dr. Lars Heckenstein, Executive Director of the Nobel Foundation, distinguished speakers, panelists, and participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I'd like to welcome and thank you all for coming to this Nobel Prize Dialogue in Tokyo. I'm Yu Chuan Zai, President of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. On behalf of JSBS, we are both pleased and honored to be able to hold this Nobel Prize Dialogue Tokyo with such a large audience in attendance. This is a full-day conference inspired by the Nobel Week Dialogue organized by Nobel Media and held each year in Sweden. This Tokyo Dialogue is the first time ever for the dialogue to be held outside of Sweden. It was organized and is being held in close coordination between JSPS and Nobel Foundation Nobel Media. The focus of today's forum is on the theme, the genetic revolution and its future impact. Regarding Japan's connection with the Nobel Prize, I'm pleased to say that it is a very close one. A large number of Nobel Prizes have been awarded to Japanese scientists and researchers in natural sciences, reflecting, reflecting a long tradition of striving for scientific and technological advancement in Japan. Still fresh in our minds are, of course, the Nobel Prizes in Physics awarded last year to Dr. Akasaki and Dr. Amano, who will deliver special lectures today, and to Dr. Nakamura. Also, I should add that JSPS and Nobel Foundation has had a long-standing and intimate relationship including the Centennial Memorial Nobel Prize Exhibition ever, or event, and also 110 years event held together in Tokyo. I'm very pleased that today's event will give us an opportunity to hear from seven distinguished Nobel laureates. Participating with them will be world-leading scientists and prominent intellectual intellectuals from Japan and abroad. Today's forum will give us an exciting opportunity to interact with a highly distinguished lineup of speakers and panelists and to engage them in a discussion of how advances in genetics and other fields will impact not only science but society as well. So thank you again to everybody for coming here and participating what I'm sure what will be our great enthusiasm in today's event. As its organizer, I look forward with strong ex expectation to today's event with its stimulating lectures and panel discussions, providing a highly illuminating experience for all of you. As such, I believe it will also contribute to promoting the advancement of science by bringing the scientific community closer together with society and the public. We all know that science is a human activity. Science is a human activity, and scientists are human beings 
who are making best efforts every day for the future of the humankind. So thank you very much and please enjoy the Nobel Prize style of Tokyo today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anzai. Now next, Dr. Lars Hagenstein, Executive Director of the Nobel Foundation, will offer his opening remarks on behalf of the co-organizer. Dr. Hagenstein, please. Thank you. Um, Your Excellencies, dear Nobel laureates, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Ohayo gozaimasu. It is a privilege to uh, welcome you all to the first Nobel Prize dialogue outside of Sweden. Three years ago, we arranged the first event of this kind in Stockholm. It became an instant success. Soon we began thinking about how to develop it and arrange it in other countries as well. From the beginning, Japan was high on our agenda. The interest in science and the consequences it has for society has or is great in your country. Over the years, you have built a strong and dynamic society based not least on a well-functioning research and educational system. Also, as Dr. Ansai alluded to here, uh, Japan is an important nation in the world of Nobel Prizes. Many Japanese have obtained the prize over the years. Here today in the program we have Dr. Tanaka, Dr. Yamanaka and Dr. Amano. Particular welcome to all of you. Let me add that we over the years also have had a good and productive cooperation with several Japanese partners, not least the ASPS in, in arranging among other things, exhibitions that also Mr. Ansai, Dr. Ansai mentioned. Most of you probably know about the Nobel Prize. Some of you might even know that Alfred Nobel was an inventor of dynamite. But uh, he was much, much more than that. He was a hardworking scientist and inventor. He was an entrepreneur with the whole world as his working field, a true renaissance man with interests not only in the natural sciences but also in philosophy, the humanities and literature. His whole life was characterized by the Enlightenment, by a search for knowledge and a strong belief that in fundamental human values. It is very difficult not to be inspired by him if you take the time and, and read a book about Alfred Nobel. He was also someone who lived very much in his time, an era that had similarities with ours, some of those similarities quite scary to ours. It, it was a time of major scientific advances, improved communications, rapidly increased trade and growing international enterprises. He was himself intimately involved in all these four. But it was also an era, just like ours, of strong social and environmental challenges in the wake of industrialization, with anti-intellectual and xenophobic tendencies and with the military build-up coupled with ruthless nationalistic actions and obvious threats to peace. It was in this world, in 1896, that Nobel's will was opened. What remained of his fortune should be used to endow prizes to those who during the preceding year have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. This is what he wrote in his will. By endowing prizes to those who had make, made breakthroughs in science, written good literature, and contributed to peace, he wanted to make a difference. He wanted to contribute to a better world. The tasks to choose the laureates he entrusted to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences for Physics and Chemistry, Karolinska Institute in Stockholm for Physiology and Medicine, and the Swedish Academy of Literature for Literature, 
all these Swedish institutions, and the Norwegian Parliament for Peace. Norway was at the time in a union with Sweden. These are the institutions who have made the prices what they are today. With competence and integrity, they have by now bestowed Nobel Prizes on almost 900 laureates. The outstanding individuals have not only by themselves made major contributions to science, literature and peace, also they and their stories uh, have served as an inspiration for many more walking in their footsteps. The universal character of the prize, the fact, the fact that it can be given to anyone uh, in the world who fulfills the criteria, and the independence with which the work by the prize-rewarding institutions have uh, been dealt with is today more important than ever. All too often sheer might and power, economic or military, keeps us as individuals or societies from taking the right decisions, those that would benefit mankind. When starting in this job, I met at one occasion with His Holiness Dalai Lama. Over a cup of tea, before I ch had a chance to say anything, he thanked the Nobel institutions for the fact that they, we, had with integrity, uh, had shown integrity and dare to stand up against strong powers. In this case, of course, he was referring to China and the Nobel Prize to Li Xiaobo, among others. But previously, the same had been the case vis-à-vis -vis Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, among others. It is in order to honor Nobel's will and his ambitions to contribute to a better world that we, engaged in activity, that we engage in activities aimed at providing information about the price and at stimulating involvement and engagement in Nobel's field of interest, in science, in the humanities, in peace. The theme of today's conference is genetics. In many ways, this theme is perfect for a conference of this kind. The scientific advancements in this area have been enormous. They do not only have far-reaching consequences for medicine, but will over time influence our societies and force us to confront difficult issues of, moral and ethical, of a moral and ethical kind as well. Today we will meet Nobel laureates whose contributions have been crucial as well as many of the best researchers now active in the field of genetics. Also, we are reaching out to the general public and to decision makers. Together, they will highlight the existing things that are happening in this field and the challenges we must confront. They will all engage in a dialogue. Dialogue is exactly what we want to see here today, on stage between you and between the participants and you in the auditorium and also online via our webcast or through our social media channels. We strongly believe in dialogue as a method of change. Let me end by only by noting that I very much myself look forward to an exciting day. There is no doubt that Alfred Nobel would have loved to be with us here in Tokyo today. Once again, welcome to the Nobel Prize Dialogue in Tokyo. Thank you so much. Next, the Japanese Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology will offer his opening remarks. Minister Hakubun Shimomura, Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, please. <clears throat> Good morning. I am Hakubun Shimomura, Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology of Japan. Today, we are very pleased that this Nobel Prize Dialogue Tokyo 2015 is being held. 
It is being jointly sponsored by the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science and the Nobel Foundation. We are very happy that several Nobel Prize winners from overseas and Japan and many other participants interested in science are here with us today. It is truly a great honor for Japan to be the first country to hold this meeting outside of the Kingdom of Sweden. The Nobel Prize Dialogue invites Nobel Prize winners to speak and to hold a dialogue with participants about cutting-edge science. This is a great opportunity for the public to get a closer sense of advanced science by speaking with Nobel Prize winners. We are proud that several Japanese scientists and researchers have won the Nobel Prize, including Dr. Koichi Tanaka and Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, last year as well, professors Isamu Akasaki, Shuji Nakamura, and Hiroshi Amano, who is here today, won the Nobel Prize in Physics for the uh, invention of the blue light emitting diode. The blue LED has spurred innovation in the global economy and society. As a Nobel Committee, as the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences noted, incandescent light bulbs lit the 20th century. The 21st century will be lit by LED wraps. Our national strategy calls for these kind of innovations to drive abenomics, our economic strategy, and to contribute to the growth of the global economy and society. The theme of this forum is a genetic revolution and its future impact. Next is very aware of the potential of regenerative medicine for the future of humanity and has especially advanced R&D on iPS cells since Dr. Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize in 2012. We have decided to provide some 110 billion yen in focused support over the next decade. Our aim is to make the promise of regenerative medicine a reality as soon as possible. This support has led to real results, including the transplant of cells to a patients suffering from age-related eye disease. This transplant was, uh, was the first of its kind in the world. It was performed by Dr. Masayo Takashi and other project leaders at Riken. It was part of clinical research on regenerative medicine using iPS cells. In 2015 and beyond, further research changes will be shifted to the clinical research stage. We are bringing together the strength of industry, academia, and government and actively promote young researchers in order to make new and radical gains in energy conservation. This will include R&D on power semiconductors using garam nitrate, which Professor Amanu has worked on. Finally, I hope 
this dialogue pro proves meaningful for all of you, as well as raises society's interest in science and contribute to the development of science and technology. I also want to express my gratitude to the Nobel Foundation for giving us the precious opportunity to follow the Nobel Prize dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Minister Shimomura will be leaving due to pressing public duties. Thank you, Mr. Sh uh, Mr. Shimomura, for joining us. Thank you. Now, this brings the opening ceremony to a close. So from here on, Dr. Adam Smith from the Nobel Foundation will host the event. So Dr. Smith, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Hashimoto. Hello again. That was exactly 20 minutes. That's great. You know, <laughs> you know, as I said, we have a packed program. So my other job today, apart from being your guide, is to be your timekeeper. As you know, this is a science and society meeting. And so we begin today with two introductory lectures, one from a science perspective and one from a society perspective. The science lecture will be given by Professor Richard Roberts, who is the 1993 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine. And of course, much of the emphasis around the genetic revolution, around people talking about the genetic revolution over recent years has been focused on the human genome. But Professor Roberts is going to tell us why we should love bacteria. Professor Roberts. How do I move the slides around? Is there? Well, um, ho hopefully along the way I can figure out how to move the slides on. How do I move the slides on? It's just not clear at all from here. Anyway, I, I have. Okay. Well, this I didn't see it on there. Okay. Thanks. So what I'm going to try and do in a few minutes is to tell you everything that you need to know so that the end of this talk, you will love bacteria as much as I do. And I'm going to start off by asking what is fueling the genomics revolution? Why is it that we feel we're in the middle of this great revolution? And the answer is that following the determination of the human genome sequence, where some new methodology was developed, after that, there was a great flurry of activity to try to develop new ways of sequencing DNA. And this has also led to a great interest in getting high throughput methods for gathering all sorts of data about organisms. Now, because this was the human genome sequence, which was the driver of this, and the fact that most congressmen are much more interested in human DNA and humans and medicine, and especially as they get older, aging, they were very interested in funding things and seeing things funded that related to the human genome. They were much less interested in funding other things. And to give you some idea of just how affordable this has become, if you look at this slide, this came off the NIH website, and it shows what's happened to the cost of DNA sequencing. On the right-hand side, it says the cost per genome. What it actually means is the cost per human genome, how much it takes in order to get a human genome sequence. On the left, essentially the same line, showing how the cost of getting sequence has gone down. But you'll see it's beginning to level off now, and we're going to need some new technologies if we're going to do it any faster. However, there is a big problem with this. And I think it's well illustrated by this um, slight um, apologies to Sidney Brenner. He says what's happening in the sequencing world at the moment is that we get a great deal of low input sequence, which means someone says, well, why don't we sequence this? They go out and make DNA. They get the sequence. It gives very high throughput. You get massive amounts of sequence out of these machines. But unfortunately, 
this massive output has led to very little understanding of what the sequence means. And this is particularly true of bacteria, as you will see in a moment. But even for the human genome, we've just not been spending a lot of money focusing on what all the genes do. We've been very interested in genes that look as though they might have a direct impact on human health. And of course, cancer is one of the big things that everybody's worried about. And there was this feeling for a long time that if you could sequence all of the cells from patients who have cancer, we could work out what genes were associated with this, and we could come up with cures. This has been a dramatic failure. I think no one in, in their right mind can look at what has happened and say this was a good expenditure of money, and yet we've spent huge amounts of money on it, and we're spending more at the moment. So why do we understand so little? Well, the answer is because there's been such a focus on humans and their health. Decreasing funds have been available for other organisms, especially eukaryotes, and even less for bacteria. You probably remember 50 years ago, bacteria were in the heyday because these were the things we could study in the lab. And now they've lost interest. The funding agencies are not that interested in anymore. And one of the problems is that as you sequence a bacterial genome, you typically get three to 6,000 genes. Do we care what those genes do? Well, apparently not, because there is no money going into trying to figure out what the function of these genes are. And in my view, and I hope by the end of this talk, you will agree that this is a tremendous wasted opportunity, and one that some countries, maybe Japan, maybe some others, want to step in and take advantage of the fact that the US and Europe have not been spending much time and effort here. Now I want to move you down and compare humans and bacteria. If we look at a typical human, something like 10 to the 13 cells are needed to make up a human. And we don't write quite know how many cell types there are, but 250, 300 is a good guess here. Whereas with bacteria, there are 10 times as many bacterial cells in your body as there are human cells. We are absolutely crawling with bacteria. They're in our guts, they're in our eyes, they're all over our skin, they're in our hair, and you can wash all you want, and most of them you can't get rid of. And that's a good thing because we need them. These bacteria are very, very good for us. They're our friends, not our enemies. In the last column, I talk about bacteriophages because one of the things that we do know is that there are very many bacteriophages in the human body. Wherever there are bacteria, there are always phages. We don't know how many there are. We've had very few systematic studies. And yet, these bacteriophages actually are controlling the population of bacteria in many ways, and it's something we need to spend some time and effort worrying about. Now, of course, when it comes to strain, a typical human is one strain. Bacteria, we put 20,000. That's a, a number that is a very, very fuzzy number. We don't really know how many bacteria live with a typical human being because we've not actually done the experiments that would be necessary to test in detail how many are needed. In terms of DNA bases, there are probably twice as many bacterial bases. But look at the number of genes. The human genome contains about 25,000 protein coding genes. The bacteria, at least a million, and many, many more. So bacteria and archaea are really important, easy to study. They comprise more than 50% of life on this planet. You don't see them. You think we're overwhelmed by plants and birds and animals and elephants because you see them. The bacteria you don't see, and yet there are more massive bacteria than there is of all of eukaryotic life. They affect every aspect of life. So just as we have metagenomes, bacteria that live with us, so do the trees and the flowers and the elephants and the pigs and the birds. They all have these bacteria living with them. And the key thing is that they are key components of our body. If we get rid of the bacteria, which we often try to do by putting out antibiotics, we give antibiotics to young kids because they get something that looks like a cold, and the mothers get worried and the doctors prescribe antibiotics, even though it's probably a viral infection, they prescribe antibiotics. And 
we have to remember that most of the bacteria that live with us, they're our friends. They're not our enemies. These are our friends. And they know how to fight pathogens. And now we're finding evidence they know how to fight cancer. And one way to think about this is that when you go out and buy a new house, and for us, we are the house for the bacteria, the first thing you do is you defend it against anybody who wants to come and live in it. And the bacteria do the same. They don't want pathogens coming along killing us because it destroys their home. Cancer does the same thing. We don't know a lot about how they do this. We should spend a lot more money figuring out how this happens. In a moment, I'll tell you, cesarean birth can be dangerous. When you deliver a baby by a cesarean section, you actually bypass the normal way in which the microbiome, the bacteria that infect a baby, actually get to the site of infection. They pick it up through the birth canal. And I'm finally going to tell you that fecal transplants, which sound quite disgusting, um, can be a very good thing and may well have implications way beyond anything we've thought of so far. Now, I use this slide just to show you that a lot of our focus in the past has been on disease. Um, as soon as Lewin Hook discovered he could see things running around in the microscope, we got very worried about these little animalcules that were out in our bodies, in our water, all over the place. And people got very worried. And then they found out what organisms caused what diseases. This was a very profitable activity. It led to a lot of good research, led to the discovery of antibiotics and all sorts of things. But we've had this focus on disease for so long that many people are unable to get over the fact that most of the bacteria are not pathogens, or if they are pathogens, they live in your body and they're kept under control by the good bacteria. I just want to mention one slide, one sorry state of functional studies. And on the left, you will see the number of unknown genes in the organisms of some actually quite well-known organisms, the number that are predicted, and the total. And I think one thing that really draws attention here is mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is one of the most deadly agents out there, kills somewhere between one and two million people a year. We've had the genome sequence now for eight or nine years, and in that time, we've discovered the function of about a dozen genes. This is the level with which we pay attention to these organisms, to bacteria. Mycobacterium, we should understand much better how it works so that we can tackle it properly. Now let's move on to probiotics and to our friends. The probiotics are things that come in yogurt. Um, they contain bifidobacterium. They contain lactobacillus. Many people love yogurt. It's good for you. Personally, I hate it, I'm afraid, but I know a lot of people like yogurt. But it's good for you, and it's good for you because it introduces live bacteria into your guts. There are some interesting problems that rise because of sort of modern medical practices. And the first of these are the cesarean births. What happens is that when a baby is born in the normal fashion through the vagina, it picks up all of the organisms, all of the bacteria that are in the vagina, and this gives that baby a really healthy start because it seeds the microbiome, and it's very important. So one of the questions is, how can you fix this? If, you know, in Brazil now, most kids are born by cesarean sections. What is happening is a lot of doctors are actually taking vaginal swabs, and they are, in fact, using the swab to infect the baby that's come from a cesarean section. And in this way, they hope to get the microbiome started. The initial results look promising, but really you're going to have to wait many years before you know if this has been really successful. I want to talk about Clostridium difficile, which is a, an interesting organism. If you go to a hospital, there's a 50% chance that you will pick up a C. difficile infection, and increasing numbers of infections are no longer treatable. The antibiotics, vancomycin and fidoxamycin, which people use to treat C. difficile, increasingly don't work. It costs about $3,000 for a treatment um, for a drug that very often doesn't work. However, there is an alternative, and it's called a fecal transplant. And the idea is that you take feces 
from a really good, healthy individual. You make a mash of this, extract as much of the bacteria and get rid of the solid matter. And then the way they used to do it would be to put a tube down and pour this down into your stomach. Well, they found a better way of doing it now. Um, a friend of mine, Libby Homan, who works at MGH, has found a way of actually taking these bacteria from a stool sample and making them into a pill. Unfortunately, the first ones they made were translucent, which didn't go down so well. Now they make them in, in a way that's not, uh, not quite the same. But I would take, ask you to look at this bottom one. The, um, the capsule does minimize the risk of a bad aftertaste, much better than having a tube down your throat. And the beauty of this is that 91% of the time, this cures the infection, okay? The success rate is 91%. And yet in the US, you're not allowed to do it unless you're part of an NIH study. So if a patient goes to a doctor and asks for this, costs about $500, you can't do it. The hospitals won't do it. And the reason is that the insurance companies won't pay for it, and they're scared of lawsuits. And I have an answer. I think the answer to this is that we should close down Harvard Law School and make all the lawyers go to medical school. <laughs> so I just want to show you, any of you who know about UPS and United Parcel Service, which deliver parcels everywhere, um, they advertise, what can Brown do for you? Well, I would argue it will do a lot more than cure C. difficile. In these stool samples are all of the bacteria that are normally keeping us healthy. There are probably very many diseases, very many mechanisms of action of the bacteria that are there that really will advance the future of medicine. And I think if we pay proper attention to the microbiome, if we understand how it works, what's there, what it's doing, that we can probably greatly reduce the costs of medicine. We, we've made a huge mistake by neglecting it for so long. I think here is the future of medicine. We know very little about the microbiome. We know very little about how it works. Um, why don't some of you go out and figure out how this all works? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank yeah. you, Richard. Okay. So, Next, we have a lecture to remind us of the social context in which scientific research operates, and we're very privileged to have Professor Helga Novotny to give that lecture. She's a professor at ETH in Zurich and also the former president of the European Research Council. So please welcome Helga Novotny. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a great honor for me to be here today and to speak on the relationship between science and society. For me, the relationship between science and society is held together by the potential that science has and the promises that science makes. So what is a promise? A promise is a bet on the uncertain future. If you give a promise, if you receive a promise, you can never be sure whether it will actually be kept, but you trust that it will be delivered. Promise is something positive. Expectation can be about negative and positive things, but promise is about the good things we hope to achieve. And it is a relationship between those who give a promise and those who believe in promises and act accordingly. So it is a relational category. And the society is offering support for science and science is promising benefits for society. And this also is the basis for this metaphorical contract between science and society that we often speak about, and when there is the feeling that trust is eroding, there always calls for a renewal of this metaphorical contract. Now, the promises have an old history. This is a picture done by Lukas Cranach the Elder, 
one of the Renaissance painters. And uh, what you see here is uh, the fountain of youth. It's what I call a wishing space. On the left side, you see elderly people, some of whom are unable to move, to come to this pool of magic water. And you see them moving out on the right side, rejuvenated and enjoying life. Now what modern science, and this is before the onset of modern science, so it's a very old dream of humanity. What modern science did is to transform this wishing space into a working space. And the working space uh, is one in which these promises of science are delivered, not always very fast, not always in the direct way. In fact, the direct way is the rare exception. It's a nonlinear relationship. But the point I want to make is that the strength of the scientific promises lies in the fact that in the long term they will be kept, even if it takes a long time. Let me just remind you here what historians of science that have studied the period following the beginning of modern science keep repeating that it took a long time until this very strong belief in scientific progress was actually validated, until you could see the first tangible results of what people were hoping for and what the first scientists were uh, promising to deliver. And it is also a strong promise, even if it's never science alone, if you take the example of longevity, where there have been enormous progresses made in terms of life expectancy. Now we can see it also happening at the global level and not only in some advanced countries. And this is a convergence of scientific insight, of practical measures like hygiene, etc., etc. And the scientific promises are strong even if the tendency that we see today to formalize the contractual relationship of promises, to insist on impact factors, on delivery dates, on milestones, which is part of the way how funding agencies operate today, even if this formalization is there, there's always the risk if you formalize too much you are risking to drive out the unpredictability, the serendipity, which is part of the scientific process. Serendipity meaning you discover something that you have not been looking for and you realize the importance of the phenomenon you are discovering. And this cannot be anticipated in advance and therefore it is important to leave this free space to discover where discovery leads you. So, scientific promises, and this is my first message to you, are still the most effective way of bringing the future into the present. Science is an open-ended activity. The horizon of the future is an open horizon. We do not know what we will still discover. And the power of scientific promises lies in what I call their cunning. Now, what is the cunning of scientific processes? The cunning lies in pushing us further into the territory of the unknown. And let me just remind you here that what many of you and certainly the Nobel laureates know very well, science thrives at the cusp of uncertainty. Uncertainty, seen in this way, is a very strong ally of scientific discoveries. And there are these unexpected detours and um, the case of stem cell research that now have ethics and Professor uh, Yamanaka has contributed enormously to the societal acceptance of stem cell research is one very good case in point. And now we are at the moment where there are the pending promises of precision medicine, of personalized medicine. Now let me <clears throat> briefly take you into the land and landscape of genomic promises. 
This is one way of imagining what the future might look like. Bright, as you can see, full of promise. This is what these images uh, convey. But there is a history <clears throat> to this, and Horizon 2020, by the way, is the name of the funding program of the European Union, Horizon 22, but that was actually a Horizon 1620. And this comes from one of the works of Francis Bacon, who was a proponent of the pragmatic uses of scientific knowledge and scientific discovery. And what you can see here is a ship passing the uh, pillars of Hercules, who, which in the ancient world were the pillars beyond which was the territory of what was not known. And if you look closely, you see the ships coming back because this is how the sail has been set and this is the promise in the way how the sails have been set. And Francis Bacon also anticipated in one of his utopian novels, New Atlantis, he anticipated genetically modified organism. I don't have the time to take you through, but it's amazing to read these texts today and how this was already uh, much on the mind of himself and his contemporaries in the 17th century. Now, <clears throat> this wonderful world of genomics and its promises has been described by people like Richard Dawkins, Eric Lander, who gave one of the lectures at, in Stockholm in 2012. It's the way how uh, epigenetics, which was already described by Waddington in the 30s, made its way back. And uh, Joshua Lederberg uh, made fun of Ohm Sweet Omics uh, in pointing to the fact how much there is still to be known. And driven, driving these developments is the endless quest for human enhancement. There is actually no end of the way how human can imagine and want human enhancement. And there's also the specter of transhumanism. Will we get to the point where artificial intelligence will wipe out what we know as humanity? Today. This has also been captured by an exhibition that was launched in 2001 by the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, the genomic revolution is here. Are you ready? was the question posed to the public, to society. So with this, we enter the social life world. And here, I just want to highlight some of the interfaces where society and science meets in this world of genomic uh, promise. What has come out as a very important and in a way also a novel experience is the way how the uniqueness of each individual in genetic terms has been confirmed while at the same time the dependence and interdependence of this uniqueness with the rest of humanity and even the rest of the living world uh, has come as a correlate. And in terms of practicalities, this means when we look at the latest developments, the UK Parliament has just passed a regulation allowing mitochondrial DNA replacement therapy in the press. This has been highlighted as the so-called three parents uh, therapy. And this means that uh, society has to get used to the fact and has to accept that there is now a peculiar kind of hybrid mixture of arrangements of biological ties. People are discovering new biological relatives through their genetic ancestry and through the way how they are related also through certain diseases to other people biologically who have the same genetic diseases. And it's the mixture between the biological, the technological and the social arrangement that uh, is one of the interfaces where science and society meet. Big data is the other interface. Big data is, enorm is enormously important for the way how the future in science and in society is proceeding. 
And big data in society very often evoke fears about a surveillance state, and this carries over even into the areas where it is clear this is meant to help people and not to survey themselves. We have also <clears throat> the relatively new prospects uh, that are opened up by transgenerational epigenetic modifications, meaning that uh, there can be influences what your grandparents were eating and the lifestyle of your grandparents on yourself, but it also means that people today carry a sense of responsibility for future generations that they just were not aware of before. There's the figure of the virtual patient where in terms of prevention, you uh, know that every one of us here in the room is a potential patient and prevention becomes very important in changing your lifestyle in order to uh, live with probabilities. And this also opens up a new interface between science and society. There is no certainty. Even with the best of knowledge, it is probability, if you are being told you have a certain probability, that uh, you might get a disease and what you can do to prevent it. Now, science has responded uh, to these concerns that were raised by the public, but also the expectation that promises will be fulfilled by wanting to communicate and also by ethical concerns. Communication of science initially started out with the wrong assumption. Scientists believed if we inform the public better, they will be able to follow what we do and they will accept and support us. And we have learned sometimes the hard way that what needs to be done is actually to engage with the public and not just to inform them. And this means opening up science. There are various movements of citizen science that aim to let the public, to let members of the lay society participate in the actual research process by contributing in various ways and even in experiments like the folded experiments where a certain protein structure was discovered by crowd uh, knowledge and getting people online to help to discover by joint uh, publications. What is also important is the framing of these debates and to follow emerging fields like synthetic biology where the microbes are microbes made to work and to die. Um, I will skip this. Ethical reflections in society are undoubtedly uh, important. And they are indispensable, but I would argue they are not sufficient. And they are not sufficient because we tend to overlook very often that it's not only the public, it's also scientists themselves that have ethical concerns. Ethical uh, concerns need time. You cannot just rush into legislation once you have the first experiment in the lab and the media taking it up and projecting very often a negative uh, future. The bigger picture must also be taken into account. Ethics is not a small concern. You have to see what are the socioeconomic factors, what are um, the risks, the possible risks of social exclusion, pushing people aside. And also, and this is a very important point, we have learned that in pluralistic societies, the same questions may lead to different answers. Just as we see societies differ in the way how they deal with ethical concerns. And this kind of value pluralism has to be um, taken into account. So I come to my conclusions. Scientific promises uh, are a very strong element in the ever-changing relationship between science and society and its dynamics. They have their power because they are cunning, because they push us towards doing more, moving into the unknown, accepting and embracing uncertainty. But in order to retain the relationship of trust, 
This can only be done through honesty and authenticity. I will hurry up, <laughs> sorry. Um, and I would just like to say health is the most precious human resource and we are working on it on both sides. Sorry for overstepping my time. I'm, I, I'm sorry to be so draconian, I apologize. <laughs> um, so we already have much food for thought from these two talks, but the Nobel Week Dialogue is, of course, largely about dialogue. And so now we're going to have a slight stage rearrangement before we have a panel discussion. So I think things need to be done. The panel discussion will be focused on the topic of the consequences of the genetic revolution, however you interpret the genetic revolution. Moderating the discussion will be Professor Joran Hansen, who is a professor at the Karolinska Institute. He's vice chairman of the board of the Nobel Foundation, and he's also, until very recently, the secretary of the Committee for the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. And then there will be four panelists who I'll introduce as they sit down. Uh, well, I don't know, are the chairs moving or staying where they are? Staying there. Right, come. Gran, come up. <laughs> First on stage, we have Tim Hunt, who is no. <laughs> okay, come on. Come on. Oh no, I, but, but I have to reseat you. I'm what, sorry. Why? I, because there's an order. Tim, you're there. Order. You're there. I'm Tim, there. I'm yes. sorry. 2001 <laughs> Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine. Then we have Kurt Wuttrich, who is 2002 Nobel laureate in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Fire, 2006 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine. This chair, please. <laughs> Professor Kohei Miyazono, who is the Dean of, of the Graduate School and the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Tokyo, please. <laughs> and Joran, over to you. Thank you very much, Adam. Good morning, everyone. So um, we will, in this first panel, bring up some topics related to the genetic revolution and uh, try to see if we have agreement or disagreement about the consequences of this fantastic era of biology uh, and medicine that we've seen in the last 50 years or so. We have limited time, so we're going to focus on a few critical questions. And without further ado, I wonder gentlemen, which were, in your opinion, the main breakthroughs of the genetic revolution? Professor Wittrich, what's your thoughts? To address your question, I think I should first make clear that in my research I work with proteins and not with genetic materials directly. And for us, the determination of the human genome and a wide variety of genomes of other species has simply changed the outlook. All of a sudden we know where we can place the work on a given protein. We no longer look for targets for our work because they are obvious or easy to work with. I always like to refer to the very first protein that was studied in much detail, that was hemoglobin. It's plentiful, it is red, <laughs> and it is easy to work with. Today, we may work on proteins which are not present in the human body of an adult, which may only be expressed before birth. And we can go back, we now know there are 25,000 genes in the human genome. And in principle, we have access to the protein that's encoded by each gene. It's a completely different world for us to plan our research. So what you're saying is that 
it's really the proteins that are the most interesting aspect of the genome, that it encodes <laughs> for proteins, and they do the job and the interesting things in the cell and in the body. Absolutely. I, I, <laughs> fully, I fully agree with your statement. And in the lecture by Professor Roberts, we heard that the funding for studies of the gene products is being reduced continuously, not only to study proteins from bacteria, but overall. And this, of course, is very short-sighted. So could one perhaps say that DNA is the master plan and the proteins are the executors of the, of the master plan? I would say that the DNA corresponds more or less to the drawings of an architect and the proteins represent the house that's built based on the drawings by the architects. Now there is something in between. We have Professor Andrew Fire here who discovered RNA-dependent gene regulation. So, Andy, would you like perhaps to squeeze in some RNA between DNA and the protein? Well, I mean, RNA is in there somewhere, but um, I, I would agree that most of the uh, business end of what goes on in cells eventually involves protein uh, and, their, and changes in protein expression. Um, RNA is a very good mechanism for getting that done. It's not the only mechanism. So, going back to what we call the genetic revolution, a series of discoveries over decades, a few decades, that changed our understanding of life. Tim Hunt, which are the most important lessons to draw from the genetic revolution, in your opinion? Well, I, I think the most important thing was that it provided us with incredibly, unexpectedly sharp tools, so we know fantastically much more today than I ever dreamt that we would when I started out on my research career. And I suppose the important thing we've learned, we have a much better understanding of the unity of life because of all this. I started working uh, on sea urchins and clams and things like that. I mean, very obscure organisms. And um, the real breakthrough came in when we discovered that uh, humans were exactly like clams and sea urchins and frogs and even yeast. I remember my boss, my former boss, Paul Nurse, who now runs absolutely everything in England, um, his hiring in a cancer institute was strongly criticized because, well, they were right. The critics said, yeast do not get cancer. What the hell are you doing, Walter Bodmer, hiring a yeast geneticist? This is ridiculous. You should be out there curing cancer. And then Paul isolated a gene which controlled cell division. And he isolated it from yeast, and we found that yeast control their cell division in exactly the same way as sea urchins, clams, frogs, and humans. And people realized they didn't know anything about the control of cell division, one of the most fundamental biological problems of all. Uh, and so the idea that actually, you know, we're all the same, and that yeast from yeast to man, all these creatures, the trees, the virus, you know, everything, everybody does it the same. And we really didn't appreciate that. So I think that's, that's absolutely fantastic, the, this unification of biology because of the genetic revolution. Do you think we should be happy because of the fact that we are so similar to sea urchins? Yeah, I, well, we're descended from sea urchins. You know, they're, they're, they're my color. Actually, I always liked the, the idea that we're related to trees. I think that's much more amazing. <laughs> and it's true. Of course, we're not green and we can't photosynthesize, but we have a lot of the same enzymes. It's going back again to uh, Kurt's point, you know. I mean, it's the DNA makes RNA, makes protein, and proteins make cells, and cells make organisms. That's... That's how it works. That's the that's crash course learned. of molecular biology. That, that's right. <laughs> that's the central dogma. We have to believe that without question. So similarity between organisms in life, that is, in your opinion, uh, one of the major lessons we've learned from this whole era. I, 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 I think genetics. so, you know, and the fact that we're really all, we're all related. Even the bacteria that Rich was talking about, I mean, you know, we're not... 
we depend upon them, but we're also related to them. It's, yeah. a, it's really an extraordinary thought. Actually, I love, Lewis Thomas said, you know, <laughs> that the most important thing is that DNA should reproduce itself exactly. But he pointed out that if it did exactly reproduce itself without ever making mistakes, there would be no music and we would all be anaerobic bacteria. Mm. <laughs> so the slight infidelity in replication it's of DNA crucial. is what has created Making mistakes, this. it turns out, is crucial. We wouldn't be here yeah. without mistakes. Isn't that a lovely thought? <laughs> <laughs> That's reassuring for all of us, isn't it? <laughs> that mistakes is what makes things progress. Yeah. Right. Mistakes, but of course correction. You know, the error... You, Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyone who would like to uh, take on here about what we have learned, what are the, the main lessons from the era of genetics and the genetic revolution? I think it remains to be seen what the main lessons are. And some of the things that we might consider to be minor lessons right now might turn out to be rather major uh, conclusions when it comes to um, especially implementing some of the some of the technologies appropriately. I think it would be interesting to see if we get to sort of true synthetic biology, actually. You know, because I think people, a lot of people thought that when you sequence the human genome, you'd be able to see exactly how intelligent everybody was, the shape of their nose, whether they were beautiful or not, and the, quite apart from any diseases they might be prone to. To. But actually, you know, you look at the genome and it, it's, it, it's like looking at a dictionary. You don't expect the dictionary to uh, write the words uh, wor works of Shakespeare. <laughs> That's it's really important to understand that. Um, so how you extract the information that's written in the dictionary to actually make an organism is still deeply mysterious. And the, I mean, the important thing is, of course, the proteins feed back on the genome, right? I mean, you know, the... You may, yes, the DNA defines the proteins, and it also probably defines where and when the stuff is made. But this becomes much more mysterious. There we have a long way to, there, a tremendously long way, in my view, to, to go. Yeah, but as you say, proteins regulate which parts of the genome are expressed. In exactly, different it's reflexive, of, right? Absolutely, there is a lot of feedback right. mechanisms. Yeah. yeah, and that makes it very complicated. I mean, that's where systems biology comes in, and I would argue that we're only at the very beginning of that, actually. So these are difficult problems. So getting the information, you know, the control of getting the information out is really central, the central problem yeah, but in biology. But having the genomic information available really makes it possible for us to put our work into perspective on a much wider range than has been possible before the year 2000 or thereabouts. Absolutely. Well, you the, know what you're dealing with. I mean, that defines the sort of scope of the problem. Yeah, and you sort of see how much there is of it or how much there should be and where your particular systems that you are just studying now with advanced and refined technology fits in into the overall picture. I, I thought of something you said, Tim, that uh, actually, the DNA sequence, the genome of the individual, doesn't say that much about the individual. Does that mean that we shouldn't worry so much about how that information is handled? What, what do you mean, not worry so much about how it's handled? You mean... You know, well, should we get all, all get sequenced and put in a I, I'm all for getting sequenced. I got myself sequenced. I'm 3% Neanderthal. <laughs> <laughs> Is and that more or less than the average? I think that's, that's quite high, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rather proud of that. <laughs> and what else? Yes, Viking, some Viking blood on my, uh, were related on my mother's <laughs> side. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, the information that you get out is, 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 is not very helpful, I, I think. And I, I think a lot of the, you know, people worry a lot about privacy issues. I actually think that, I, you know, it might be embarrassing in one or two cases, but I, I think they're probably mostly minor. I don't care who knows my DNA sequence. It's fine by me. You can have it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, Professor Miyasono, yes. do you agree? Is it uh, uh, uninteresting enough to be shared? Um, well, 
I think it is very important to have a genome sequence of many people, and such a kind of big data can be shared with other people so that in the future we can find some important genes that is probably an Indu uh, cause some disease not by single mutation or something, but by the combination of these uh, sequence uh, di uh, data may be useful for some kinds of metabolic diseases or some other kinds, of, not a cancer, but some other diseases. So I think the uh, whole genome sequencing is just like a dictionary. I fully agree with you. And uh, messenger RNA or small RNA or proteins are very important for uh, functions because we predicted that genome sequencing, uh, we can uh, understand everything, but that is not true. And the phenotype of the, each gene is very more important. So I think we can learn more from the uh, whole genome sequencing and more to come in the future, I think, yes. Well, as a structural biologist, I should bring in at this point that we still interpret DNA only in terms of the linear sequence. We know that DNA is extremely densely packed in the cell. And nobody talks about this in everyday usage of genomic information. See, in proteins, we are long past the state where we would just talk about the sequence. But this is the way we talk about the DNA. And then only a few percent yes. of the total amount of DNA in our body is understood in terms of cloning, encoding proteins or RNAs. Yeah. The majority of the sequence is... Uh, well, junk, some the people junk, say. junk <laughs> DNA, they yeah. say. Yes, but and I'm sure. people say it's not junk. You know, yeah. the uh, there is no this. reason to believe <laughs> that the majority of our DNA should be useless. And I think, I think we have a lot to learn, especially about those parts of the DNA that we do not understand, and which is most certainly not just junk. Mm. <laughs> and I think we have to understand in much more detail how the three-dimensional arrangement of the DNA and chromatin uh, impacts on the way the whole organism functions. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> is that... Uh, well, I'm not so sure. I, I actually hate these people who say, you know, it's all in the... Where the, gene, where the DNA is in the nucleus depend. You know, this is all important. It doesn't seem to have great explanatory power to me. You may be right, of course. I mean... And in some it's too complicated it, you know, and it's to be un understood. Unknowable. It's much easier yeah. to just read off a sequence of letters. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And it is basically a linear molecule. I mean, right? I mean, yeah, Proteins are also linear yeah, molecules. Yeah, yeah, but proteins are a lot floppier, Kurt. You know that. <laughs> I mean, they, they sort of, you know, they may be a piece of string, but they very quickly wrap up into a yeah, ball. But the yeah. DNA is stiffer only because you always see the Double helix. Well, you can bend it a little strand, bit, but it's... I forget, how much can it bend? I, people have measured how much it can bend. I remember. Oh, yeah, DNA will bend about every 240 base pairs or I mean, so. It's, it's yeah. not all that. It is pretty stiff, actually. It's, really it's stiff. a double helix. But you but can bend you it a lot more. Strands, oh, if you have single strands, yes, then, then it's it's all, all bets are off. It's so true. what you're saying is that the easy phase of linear DNA sequencing has been done, and now comes the hard phase of understanding how it's put together and used and how the complex interactions there operate. I guess we understand a bit about how the proteins as transcription factors act on the DNA, yeah. but there's so much more yeah, yeah. to learn about how it mm -hmm. all functions in the cell. So let yeah. me ask, how, can we do that in the same way as the Human Genome Project, by a huge effort by many labs going after um, to make a, a map together, or do we need sort of the old classical hypothesis-driven research? I think what you've just said brings up in many scientists what one of our politicians called the huge sucking sound. 
of big science <laughs> drawing everything in to a, a huge project that's going to then, and I think a lot of us worry about that. It's, it's not clear what the approach would be, and, and uh, many of the advances in big science have come from relatively small science that have really sort of exploded um, as, as people have realized the significance of it, like high-throughput sequencing, which was the result of a small company and a relatively small research, a couple of relatively small research groups in, in Sweden and England and U.S. Um, it is true. I mean, the Human Genome Project was basically, I mean, you know, the methodology was worked out by Fred Sanger, more or less by himself, and then that was simply applied on an industrial scale, so you could really see what you had to do, and there was an awful lot of it to do, and people doubted whether it could be done. And how, you know, but you could just see, it was just a chemical problem. You just had to carry on and, and, and do it, whereas, and, and, and it was sort of predictable what you would get. I mean, there was only four nucleotides, and you just had to put all three times 10 to the ninth of them in the right order. I mean, a challenging problem, I'll admit, but a simple one, scientifically speaking, whereas what most of us do most of the time is actually try to discover things, and in discovering things, you sort of turn over stones, and if you're lucky, you find something really interesting under one of the stones you, you've turned over, but uh, it, it's really much more playful and uncertain, and great discoveries are by their very nature unknown because you didn't even know that what you discovered was out there in the first place. So they, this, is, this well, makes the, it difficult. You the know? question really here is whether or not we are in a position to formulate the project. You see, in, in when, when we talk about what's the impact of the nonlinear properties of DNA, how can we tackle this? Can this be tackled by uh, uh, big science approach or does it need does it still need some crucial ideas i think that's clever people <laughs> it always needs clever people it's, it's or powerful the, computers it's well, you see I, I, isn't it reassuring that there is still a role for clever people and creative individuals and it cannot all be organized in an industrial fashion in in, in discovering you know, what's left to discover in life science yeah, I, in that sense, I think epigenetics and metabolome and some other new techniques are very valuable. And if you compare some cancer cells and normal cells, and if you check the uh, uh, structure of the linear DNA, how they are compacted, it is quite different in between normal cells and cancer cells. Mm -hmm. And such a kind of information will be very valuable in the future, how uh, one protein can act as an oncoprotein in certain cells, but not in oncoprotein in other cell types. So such a kind of information may be very valuable in the future, but we should actually do a lot more in the future, yeah. We, and we have to do a lot more experiments, yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah. So, so for the last few minutes of the panel, uh, I'd like to turn to, to Professor Miyazono again and ask you, how, has the genetic revolution changed the lives of ordinary people. We talked a lot about how it changed science, but what's the consequences for all of us, uh, everybody in Tokyo or in Japan or in the world? Well, uh, I, am, uh, I, was, I started as a clinical hematologist and oncologist, so I know more about the cancer uh, and concerning uh, the uh, discovery of oncogenes and anti-oncogenes we learned that uh, some cancers are induced by uh, mutations in certain oncogenes. For example, you know that the uh, uh, American, movie star, um, American movie star has done uh, a protective mastectomy because of the mutation in one of the breast cancer oncogenes. And such a kind of uh, information will be, uh, maybe have a, a strong impact on uh, on uh, clinical medicine. But concerning the public, I really don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, well, we have a lot of new drugs, don't we? New drugs, yes, I new mean, drugs, yes. Human insulin, yes. growth hormone, yes, yes. Uh, monoclonal That's antibodies. True. Yes, yeah, so uh, molecular targeting therapy is now very popular. So, uh, for example, if you have a mutation in one oncogen, then you can use the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor or some other drugs that specifically uh, inhibits these uh, kind of uh, oncogenes. So uh, that kind of new drugs are really 
also it's changed uh, TV entertainment dramatically. Because yes. you can every crime story there is on TV at night, <laughs> yeah. they solve the, uh, yeah, the, the, the murder most... with <laughs> DNA technology. <laughs> yes. oh, right. So isn't right. that a good example? I think right. the best example is people who have been you know, wrongly convicted of murder and have been released. Right. I mean, that yes. really yeah. is That's fantastic wonderful. for yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, we're waiting to see what's, how it will change agriculture. With yes, genetically right. modified organisms, right. it's a controversial yes, yes. topic, but yes. uh, I never understand why that's controversial. I mean, has anybody ever really been poisoned by genetic engineering? I don't think so. I don't think so either. I, I hope that uh, one of the panels this afternoon will address that. Uh -huh, we don't okay. have much time. But but I think right I, here we should make a statement, namely that there are genes, also in nutrients that have <laughs> not been genetically modified. <laughs> yes. Everybody yeah. have DNA for breakfast. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we, um, we modify our environment all the time, and so the, the idea of genetic modification is new, I think, is a little bit of a, of a, uh, a question. We've, we've modified things for years, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. I think the question is whether we're going to modify them rationally, given more power. And that's something I think that we have some responsibility as a society and as scientists to, to ensure. But that we're going to keep modifying and that we're going to need to do that is there's really no question. And that we're going to need the new technologies to be able to provide food is also no question. Isn't that a good final statement from this panel that we need all, all of our scientists have a responsibility to use the new knowledge from the genetic revolution to improve conditions, uh, for instance, when it comes to food supply for the globe, as well as for improving health, and that we should use the new knowledge to do it in a rational way and so much more efficiently than was ever possible in the past. In addition to that, we've learned that we've understood how similar we all are, not only within the human species, but even down to Tim Hunt's favorite organisms, the sea urchins. <laughs> And these are just some of, some of the things we learned from this fantastic era of science. And with that, we'll close the panel and move on to the coffee break, I think. So uh, thank you very much for listening to us. Oh, very good. Very good. Fine. Do you want to make? You, you go ahead. Please go ahead. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have some uh, lectures following this as, uh, this as well, but we would like to stop and take coffee break here. I would like to announce where the refreshments are. So, the refreshments are in the lobbies of floor five and floor seven. We're on floor seven now, but there's more refreshments on floor five as well. So, please help yourselves. Uh, enjoy your break. And the next lectures will begin at 11.45. 11.45. Thank you. I don't think that ever before have such an extraordinary group of experts from across the science and society interface been gathered together in a meeting that is free, open to anybody to attend. To have this critical mass of laureates together, I'm almost thinking that they might disappear in a black hole. <laughs> Communication is, is the whole thing. It's, it's a luxury to have all these people that have uh, so much knowledge. Ideas and innovations and thoughts from such a distinguished panel of, of Nobel laureates and others. The outmost of the mix of both researchers and policymakers and industry in the same room. In a democracy, I believe that unless you inform the public, you're really not going to provide a basis for policymakers to take initiative. This uh, extends what the Nobel Prize is about, which is, is a celebration of science and, and ultimately how science can be useful for society. I believe knowledge and science in general can only thrive if it is questioned. I'm also happy to have the opportunity to ask the with my own questions. Well, I think it's a very valuable get-together and uh, a very, very rich dialogue, I must say. I think Nobel Dialogue is a very, very creative idea. Well, anything that actually 
uh, advances intelligent discussions, I think uh, it's something I'm glad to support, and that's why I'm here. That the Nobel Peace Prize for 2009 is to be awarded to President Barack Obama. I believe that peace is unstable where citizens are denied the right to speak freely or worship as they please. If I am asked why I'm fighting for democracy in Burma, it is because I believe that democratic institutions and practices are necessary.
I don't think that ever before have such an extraordinary group of experts from across the science and society interface been gathered together in a meeting that is free, open to anybody to attend. To have this critical mass of laureates together, I'm almost thinking that they might disappear in a black hole. <laughs> Communication is is the whole thing. It's, it's a luxury to have all these people that have uh, so much knowledge. Ideas and innovations and thoughts from such a distinguished panel of, of Nobel laureates and others. The outmost of the mix of both researchers and policymakers and the industry in the same room. In a democracy, I believe that unless you inform the public, you're really not going to provide a basis for policymakers to take initiative. This uh, extends what the Nobel Prize is about, which is, is a celebration of science and, and ultimately how science can be useful for society. I believe knowledge and science in general can only thrive if it is questioned. I'm also happy to have the opportunity to ask to raise my own questions. Well, I think it's a very valuable get-together and uh, a very, very rich dialogue, I must say. I think Nobel dialogue is a very, very creative idea. Well, anything that actually uh, advances intelligent discussions, I think, uh, is something I'm glad to support, and that's why I'm here. That the Nobel Peace Prize for 2009 is to be awarded to President Barack Obama. I believe that peace is unstable where citizens are denied the right to speak freely or worship as they please. If I am asked why I'm fighting for democracy in Burma, it is because I believe that democratic institutions and practices are necessary.
I don't think that ever before have such an extraordinary group of experts from across the science and society interface been gathered together in a meeting that is free, open to anybody to attend. To have this critical mass of laureates together, I'm almost thinking that they might disappear in a black hole. <laughs> Communication is is the whole thing. It's, it's a luxury to have all these people that have uh, so much knowledge. Ideas and innovations and thoughts from such a distinguished panel of, of Nobel laureates and others. The outmost of the Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to the Nobel Prize Dialogue Tokyo 2015. We have a number of reserved seats, but the rest are open, so please kindly proceed to the front of the hall to fill the seats from the front. Smoking is not allowed in this venue. Please use the designated smoking areas if necessary. Please turn off your cell phones or switch them to silent mode. We also request that you refrain from bringing babies or small children with you. For translation, we have English Japanese simultaneous interpretation today. The receivers are being handed out at the entrance. So please pick one up if you wish. Japanese is available on channel 1, and English is available on channel 2. After use, please return the simultaneous interpretation receivers at the exit. Please make sure that you do not take them with you. Wi-Fi is available in this venue. And this dialogue will be live streamed over the Internet. Please access the official website of the dialogue to view the live stream. In case of an emergency, please wait for instructions from our staff. If necessary, you will be given directions for evacuation. The next lectures are scheduled to begin at 11.45 a.m. Please wait a little longer until we are ready to begin. Thank you. Let's begin this ending now. Thank you so much. Thank you. If I am asked why I am fighting for democracy in Burma, it is because I believe that democratic institutions and practices are necessary.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, and amongst others in the audience today, we have a particularly special group of students who've come to the HOPE meeting from 17 different countries. Where are you, HOPE students? Over there, in the back there. Hello, everybody. And <laughs> Welcome to Tokyo. Now, for this next session, we're going to have five talks in a row. Uh, at the beginning and end, we're going to have presentations from uh, Japanese Nobel laureates, and then there will be three talks in the middle that will introduce some of the themes that will come up in the, in the discussion streams this afternoon. But to start us off, I'm very happy to announce that we have Professor Shinya, Shinya Yamanaka with us, one of the 2012 Nobel laureates in physiology or medicine, and he's going to introduce us, introduce us to the many possibilities of iPS cells. So, Professor Shinya Yamanaka. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a great honor to have uh, this great opportunity here in Tokyo. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, JSPS as well as Nobel Foundation to uh, uh, have this great opportunity. So, uh, I'm a scientist, but I really love playing sports. Uh, I used to play judo and rugby, but now I play uh, marathon and some golf. Uh, two weeks ago, I ran a marathon in Kyoto, and for the first time in my life, I cut four hours. I finished less than four hours. So, uh, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, playing sports uh, gave me a lot of energy and uh, uh, gave me a lot of uh, uh, motivation to continue my own research and uh, uh, directing our own research center. So sport is great, but at the same time, sport sometimes can result in disaster, tragedy. It can cause uh, this kind of uh, uh, intractable uh, injuries. Once this kind of spinal cord injury happens, basically we cannot do anything to these patients. Only basic research, medical basic research, may be able to help these patients, not now, but in the near future. So that's why I started my career as a surgeon, but that's why I uh, changed my career from uh, hospital to uh, uh, laboratories. So I have a vision, my vision of being a scientist to contribute to uh, new medicine, new treatments for patients like him suffering from uh, intractable diseases and injuries. However, it's very easy to say, but it's very difficult to uh, achieve to make a new treatment by doing basic research. But very luckily, we uh, met this technology, iPS cell technology, in uh, 2006, almost 10 years ago. Uh, we found that by uh, putting these four factors, four genes, into mouse and human skin cells, we can actually convert skin cells back into embryonic state. So we can make uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells directly from skin cells. We uh, de designated these new types of skin stem cells, iPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. IPS cells have two important properties. Uh, first, we can uh, expand IPS cells as much as we want. Then, we can uh, differentiate IPS cells into virtually all types of somatic cells that exist in the body, including uh, brain cells, muscle cells, heart cells, and blood cells. I uh, want to say that it is not by myself uh, who generated iPS cells. This is uh, thanks to many of my colleagues in my own laboratories, es especially these three young members of my lab, Yoshimi, Kazutoshi, and Tomoko. Without these three people, we could have never generated iPS cells, at least in my own laboratory. So I'm very, very grateful to these young members of my uh, own lab. 
So now we can uh, generate iPS cells, uh, not only from skin cells, but also from many other types of uh, cells, including blood cells. So all we need is a small amount of peripheral blood samples, uh, just like 3 ml or 5 ml. And by putting those small number of factors, we can convert blood cells into stem cells, iPS cells. Once they become iPS cells, they are totally different in morphology, in proliferation, and in differentiation ability. We can expand these iPS cells as much as we want. Then, by stimulating, stimulating these iPS cells with some like, uh, uh, cytokines and some chemicals, we can make many types of somatic cells in a large, huge quantity. For example, we can make uh, this kind of, uh, I hope, yes, uh, beating uh, heart cells. In uh, hundreds of dishes, we can make uh, this kind of beating heart cells. These cells used to be skin cells or blood cells just uh, three or four months ago, but now they are beating. So uh, even now, every time I see these beating heart cells, I feel uh, a, bit, a little bit strange. With this technology, uh, we want to uh, help patients suffering from intractable diseases and injuries. There are two major medical applications of technology. One is cell therapy, and the, the other one is uh, drug development. Both are equally important. Uh, cell therapy is uh, often uh, 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 reported by uh, Japanese uh, media people, so uh, cell therapy is very uh, popular, but I would say drug development is at least as equally important as cell therapy, and I would say uh, drug development may be uh, more important than cell therapy as uh, medical applications of iPS cells. So uh, let me give you a small uh, examples of each applications. Uh, let me begin with uh, cell therapy. Thanks to a uh, huge and continuous support from the Japanese government, especially from the Ministry of uh, 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 Education, MEXT, Japan, I think, I believe, leads the world uh, in terms of cell therapy using iPS cells. These diseases and injuries are very close to the clinical uh, trial. Some of these uh, being, will be uh, conducted in Kyoto, uh, but uh, uh, others will be uh, conducted in uh, uh, other places in Japan, uh, like uh, Keio University, Osaka University, and Riken Institute. Uh, we have been collaborating to all of those Japanese uh, 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 researchers. So, uh, as uh, uh, Minister Shimomura mentioned this morning, uh, Dr. Masao Takahashi has already uh, initiated clinical trial using iPS cells. She, she uh, generated iPS cells from a patient suffering from age-related macular degeneration. It's a, a major uh, cause of blindness in many, many countries, including Japan. Uh, in this patient, in these patients, a small number of cells called uh, pigmental, retinal pigmental epithelial cells are injured. That's why they lose uh, uh, eye vision. But Masayo Takahashi was able to uh, obtain iPS cells, and uh, she was able to generate retinal pigmental epithelial cells from patient on iPS cells. And last September, uh, she, uh, her team transplanted uh, uh, those iPS cell-derived pigmental epithelial cells back into the patient. It's been uh, uh, almost six months, and I heard from Dr. Masao Takahashi that the patient is being, uh, doing uh, uh, well. In our own I'm sorry, Institute in uh, Kyoto, or Dr. Jun Takahashi has been working on Parkinson disease. Uh, in this patient, uh, a specific type of brain cells 
which, in, which produces, which produce dopamine, are injured. Uh, because of that, they cannot move, move smoothly. But now, uh, Dr. Jun Takahashi can make dopamine producing uh, neurons from iPS cells. She, he is now testing efficacy and safeness in a monkey model of Parkinson disease, and it, it's very promising. So uh, we're hoping that he will uh, apply for, a clinic, for clinical trial sometimes this year. So it's uh, uh, just around the corner. Dr. Jun Takahashi is very famous as a, a brain surgeon and also as a, a neuroscientist, but he, he, he may be more famous now uh, as, a, as the husband of Masao Takahashi. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, another colleague of mine, Dr. Koji Eto, has been working on blood differentiation from iPS cells. He can now generate functional uh, platelets as well as erythrocytes from uh, human iPS cells. And he will be uh, transplanting these uh, blood cells into patients. Well, now uh, we can have uh, enough amount of blood samples from blood donors thanks to Japan Red Cross. But we, Japan, is a, a world-leading aging society. In five years or ten years, we will short on blood donors. So we need to do something. This strategy, Dr. Koji Eto's strategy, is very promising. Actually, he's been working uh, together with Japan Red Cross to promote this uh, strategy. How about spinal cord injuries? Well, we have been collaborating with Keio University, uh, Dr. Hideyuki Okano, and also Dr. Uh, uh, Nakamura to achieve this uh, cell therapy. So we are making neural stem cells from iPS cells, and we are going to transplant neural stem cells into patients suffering from uh, spinal cord injuries, uh, hoping that we can achieve functional recovery. Uh, KO team is now testing this strategy in monkey, and again, they are obtaining very promising results. So hopefully, within a few years, uh, they will start human clinical trial. So uh, let me move on drug development. Well, I will only give you one example of drug development, but that does not mean uh, drug de drop de development is less important. Again. I believe that drug development using iPS cells is at least as important as cell therapy and probably more important. Let me uh, use this as an example to explain this uh, uh, application. Achondroplasia. It's a, a very rare uh, disease uh, causing dwarfism. These two boys are identical identical twin. But in, when they were in uh, the uterus of their mother, one point mutation uh, happened to one of these two boys. And that just one point mutation uh, caused this uh, dwarfism, achondroplasia. So uh, in this patient, uh, this boy cannot produce a sufficient amount of chondrocytes in his bones. That's why he's suffering from uh, dwarfism. We don't have cures for these patients. Dr. Noriyuki Tsumaki in our institute, he joined our institute just uh, four years ago. Uh, before joining to our institute, he did not have any experiences using iPS cells. So he, he started just three, years, three or four years ago. He generated uh, iPS cells from uh, patients suffering from this disease and also from a uh, normal individual. When iPS cells are undifferentiated, he did not see any differences between patient and uh, normal or individual-derived iPS cells. Dr. Tsumaki has also developed a very uh, robust and efficient way to generate uh, cartridge chondrocytes from iPS cells. 
when he applied that procedure on normal iPS cells, he was able to generate a, a cluster of a beautiful or, or cartilage or chondrocytes, which is shown by red. He stained this uh, cluster chondrocyte with a specific chemical that stain, specifically stain uh, uh, chondrocytes in red. However, when he applied the, uh, exactly the same procedure on patient-derived iPS cells, they, they were not able to produce any functional chondrocytes. So this means his team was able to recapture disease. Uh, disease of not being able to produce chondrocytes in petrish. Well, in this picture, we only have one hu human patient, but we could have hundreds of petrish having these uh, disease models in laboratories. So that means we can test hundreds of drug candidates by using iPSL-derived disease models. And that's what exactly Dr. Tsumaki performed. And surprisingly, surprisingly, he found that one existing drug, statin. Statin is a well-known drug for lowering cholesterol. I believe that probably one-third or maybe one-fourth of this audience is taking statin. But this uh, same drug, statin, dramatically uh, reverted this disease phenotype in iPS cells. Uh, by simply adding statin, now uh, Dr. Tsumaki was, is able to produce a beautiful cluster of uh, chondrocyte even from patient iPS cells. So this kind of uh, approach is called drug repositioning. Use existing drugs in other diseases uh, hopefully in uh, rare diseases and intractable diseases, so that we can skip many steps of drug development. Drug development is a long, long, uh, it, it takes at least 10 years, and it's very expensive. But by uh, performing this kind of drug repositioning, we can shortcut many of the steps, and we can uh, decrease uh, the cost. So hopefully within a year or two, we can bring this uh, starting to patients, children, suffering from uh, 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 dwarfism. Uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Norik Tsumaki uh, and myself uh, came from the same junior and senior high school. <laughs> and we actually uh, belong to uh, the same judo club. So I've known him for a long time. Uh, many people told me that doc Dr. Tsumaki is somehow similar to me. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. But I hope, I, I believe that I have a little bit more hair than Dr. Tsumaki. <laughs> I really hope so. Yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> uh, Kyoto University, five years ago, Kyoto University launched this new institute, Center for IPS Research and Application, to promote these two medical applications of iPS cells. To us, this last uh, letter A, application, means a lot. This is our vision. We really want to uh, uh, realize medical applications of I iPS cells. You know, we do write papers. We do try to publish papers in nature and science, but that's not our final goal. Our final goal is to bring this technology to patients to realize applications. So, uh, with these brilliant colleagues, we are doing our best. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, so much. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. I'm very pleased that Professor Yamanaka kept so perfectly to time because I didn't relish the thought of trying to stop a judo expert from talking. <laughs> so, as you see from your programs, um, this afternoon, after lunch, you have the chance to choose two out of the six parallel panel discussions that are running. And the next three talks will introduce some of the themes that will appear in some of those panel discussions, partly, as I suppose, an advertisement for those panels. And first, we have Professor Tiki Pang from the National University of Singapore to talk about the impact of genomics in the developing world. 
Professor Pang. Slide advance here. This is forward, forward slides, time, slides. Um, thank you very much, uh, Adam. It is a really daunting experience to deliver a paper following one from a Nobel laureate, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is biobanks uh, in the developing world uh, on the topic especially of a need for uh, better governance. So let me begin by saying what, what is the issue here. And I think many of you know that biobanks are large scale collection of blood and tissue samples, donors' personal information, long-term access to past as well as future medical and other health-related records. It has become a major activity in the world of uh, genomic science. And the goal of the biobanks are, of course, to analyze the complex interplay of lifestyle, environmental, and genetic factors as causes of a range of diseases, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and even infectious diseases. As the title suggests, our particular interest is really in the occurrence of the biobanks in the developing countries. So we started doing a little bit of mapping of these biobanks, and basically what we found by December 2014, that there was a total of 150 of these biobanks in 30 developing countries, 32 of which are in China. To be honest, I was uh, quite surprised at that particular finding. It follows that uh, we try to map where these biobanks are. You can see from this uh, slide that it's in all parts of the world, in Latin and Central America, in Africa, in the Middle East, as well as in Asia, with China and India being particularly prominent. The next slide just gives you a listing of the countries where we have identified the existence of these biobanks. And as you can see, in some of these countries, there are multiple biobanks in existence. Um, what have we observed as a result of this study, which is still ongoing, I should mention, uh, in the sense that we also uh, highlight a few of the major biobanks that many of you know about. There, there is one, a well-known one in Mexico, in Gambia, in, in China, of course, in Africa, and in, in Jordan. And you will see from the third table there that many of these biobanks inter involve international collaborations involving the US NIH, for example, as well as, 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 as the Wellcome Trust. So this is just a partial listing. But what did we observe in our preliminary analysis? Firstly, is that there are many, many different types of biobanks, focus on diseases, focus on tissue types, a whole range of them, different sizes, different levels of activity. I suspect we don't know the exact number. Many of them are collecting sample, samples non-systematically and storing them randomly. Um, there seems to be limited information available. Publicly accessible data is rarely updated, and, and therefore progress in these biobanks is, is hard to monitor. Uh, the literature that we've uncovered is mostly not in the English uh, language, and a lot of it is in local journals, which means that many of these activities are rarely cited or commented upon in mainstream academic journals. Um, importantly, governance systems for these biobanks are either absent, overlapping, or not enforced. And finally, as Helga has mentioned this in her lecture this morning, there seems to be little evidence of public engagement and consultation in the development and establishment of these biobanks. Why is it that we're particularly interested in better governance of these biobanks? I put it to you that there are perhaps four main reasons. Firstly, many developing countries have limited research capacity to both run and to manage these biobanks. Importantly, there is inadequate or weak 
legislative structures and governance frameworks to protect research participants and communities from unfair distribution of risks and benefits associated with being involved in biobank activities. Um, as I mentioned, international collaboration and importantly, private sector involvement is seen in many biobanks in developing countries. This, of course, brings up very important cross-border issues such as benefit sharing and data access. Clearly, there is significant commercial potential of biobank activities, as illustrated partly by Dr. Yamanaka's lecture. And I think having better governance in the long term will improve the efficiency of the research process globally, given that, of course, there are many, many biobanks in the developed world, which is not subject of, of this presentation. So if you take those four reasons together, it stands to reason that there are many ethical, legal, economic, and social concerns about how these biobanks are operating. At the moment, it's like letting a thousand flowers bloom. So our thesis is that we really need to define and, if possible, implement a fair, equitable, and feasible biobank governance framework to ensure a fair balance of risks and benefits among all the stakeholders, not just the participants, but especially the, the participants. In this paper that we just published in the bulletin of the WHO, uh, there we propose six elements of a possible framework for better governance. The first is respecting participants and donors of biological samples and protecting their privacy and confidentiality. Informing participants and donors of potential risks through initial consultations. Sharing samples, data, and benefits in a fair, transparent, and equitable manner. Ensuring quality and interoperability of samples and their associated, associated data. I think this has been mentioned in one of the talks this, this morning. Um, the fifth element is improving public awareness, trust, and participation in biobanks. I think that's a particularly important element that Helga Novotny emphasized this morning. And finally, given the commercial potential, defining the role of the private sector in the use of knowledge derived from biobank operations. How might this framework be translated into reality? Well, you could imagine the development of best practices and guidelines, either at the global or at the national level. Uh, you could consider establishing a global registry of biobanks. I worked for the World Health Organization for 13 years, and one of the things I did was to help establish an international clinical trials registry platform. So would it be an idea to establish a similar registry for biobanks. And finally, if the need is probably strong enough, there could be the possibility of endorsement and adoption of an international legal framework or convention to govern the operations of biobanks. Who might actually implement such a governance framework? The World Medical Association that you know is the author of the Declaration of Helsinki for Ethics Involving Research with Human Subjects. In their seventh revision in 2013, actually included biobanks. There are numerous international and regional initiatives and networks. I won't mention them all. Consortium and platforms exist, which are very actively interested in this area. Uh, and. Of course, importantly, the international organizations under the umbrella of the United Nations. Um, UNESCO is one possibility, but the WHO, the World Health Organization that I used to work for, the World Trade Organization because of the associated intellectual property, and perhaps uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, once again, because of the, 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 the pot potential patenting of some of this information. 
Let me just finish by reflecting back on the genetic revolution and its future impact, the theme of our dialogue today, and asking, you know, why is it so important that these activities are governed in a fair manner? So what are the benefits of biobanks for the developing world? Importantly, it will help these countries to tackle the double burden of chronic and communicable diseases. About 56 million people die every year from various causes. 35 million of that is due to chronic disease. But the developing countries, of course, have a double burden because they still have a problem with infectious disease. And the Ebola outbreak is one very good example. So I think the biobanks have that potential. Importantly, and um, um, this morning we heard about medical care being becoming much more expensive. Um, I see a time when biobanks will help these countries to deal with rising healthcare costs and weak health systems through more efficient and targeted interventions. And finally, of course, and not least important, is to help strengthen the research capacity within these countries to promote economic development and future self-sufficiency. I think the value of science in improving the lives of people living in the developing world was very nicely captured more than 60 years ago by Jawaharlal Nehru, who was India's first prime minister. He said, I see no way out of our vicious cycle of poverty except through the means that science and technology has placed at our disposal. I'm sure Nehru could not have foreseen that one day India will have 19 biobanks. But I'm sure he will see that, gen that the genetic revolution can have a very significant impact on achieving the noble mission of the World Health Organization, which is the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Time. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So one of the themes to emerge from Johan Hansen's consequences panel just before the coffee break was the role of genetics in agriculture and food. And I'm delighted to say that we now have a talk on that subject from Professor Louise Fresco, who's the president of Wageningen University in the Netherlands. So please join me in welcoming Professor Fresco. Thank you, Thank you very much, Arthur. So you have your slide. Yeah, right. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's a great honor to be here. And let me indeed change the subject and see what genetics can do to food and agriculture, which is such a pressing issue in our future. But in order to understand the role of genetics, I have to take you a little bit on a historical um, journey first. Now, when man invented agriculture 10,000 years ago, genetics actually was no more than selection haphazardly for qualities that were important. As you know, agriculture started in the Middle East and it was about selecting wild grasses and moving slowly into what we now know as wheat and later on also in China, of course, the selection of wild grasses that became rice. But all that was haphazard work. And it took us 10,000 years until the 19th century to actually starting to understand something about the genetics. Because when genetics is no more than uh, haphazard selection, then all kinds of qualities actually come together. You select for better fruits, but with it comes, for example, a greater susceptibility for disease. And it was in the 19th century that three things happened that have changed our landscape. One is, of course, that Darwin showed to us that evolution takes place all along, and that it's the adaptation of the fittest individuals that make all the difference. And, of course, Mendel explained to us that it is the discrete um, inheritance of traits that makes the difference. So it's not that everything becomes muddled in the next generation. These are discrete properties, white or red, 
and not everything pink when it comes to flowers, for example. But there was more. Of course, in the 19th century, we also discovered the use of fertilizers, the use of fossil fuels for agriculture. And you cannot understand the genetics of food and agriculture without understanding that whole conglomerate of innovations all together replacing, for example, human labor with um, mechanized labor. Then, of course, in the 20th century, we had Watson and Crick making us to understand how actually the genome functions. Now, the challenges before us are enormous. And I believe, and I would really like to put this forward to you, that there is no solution to our future challenges of producing more food with less impact on the environment and of better quality if we do not use genetics. But how are we going to do that? Let's just first go to classical breeding, which is just selecting, but selecting, of course, as much as possible for good qualities. Here you see the progressive um, effect of introducing new varieties over time. And what you see is the dotted line are the, uh, the farm observed yields, and you see the effect of genetics on the line above it. This is a rather complicated statistics. Well, what it shows to you that over time, over the last few decades, in a country like the Netherlands, with very highly intensive agriculture, genetics still make all the difference. You have continuous growth of yields. Now, the two ways in which genetics can help when it comes to agriculture. One is to bridge the yield gap when you are still very far from reaching that. That's, for example, the case of Africa. And the other one is to actually move the biological maximum yield. So go beyond what we ever imagined possible. Now, deal with both of them. Now, decreasing the yield gap or, on the other hand, increasing the yield potential require a very good understanding of what we call the genotype, environment and management interactions. Just, just look at the colors, don't worry too much. This is about changing the physiology of a plant to get a better proportion between roots and stems or leaves. And what you see on the right hand side, the red, is that what we do is to select also for drought stress. And the most important thing is that when we work with new varieties, they should be able to be stress uh, tolerant. And that's a very important thing in many countries, many developing countries. Now, it's not just about crops, it's also about animals. And here you see the effect of 45 years of breeding. And the main, perhaps the most interesting one is for pigs. You see the output of kilos of pig per unit of food has actually increased by 100% in 45 years. That is all genetics. Management, of course, has improved, but it's the responsiveness of the individual to better feed that has made a difference. And it actually applies, again, this is the Netherlands, very comparable in some cases to Japan, all across the board. Now, I don't need to tell you what the genomics revolution is, but what it did this, the fact that we can now sequence genomes, uh, we can understand so much better how traits are situated in the genome of a plant or an animal, actually has allowed us to go for completely new goals in breeding. So no more haphazard selection, no more just stress selection. It really is about defining new goals. And let me just take that to animal breeding. Complex traits, very complex ones, such as getting the milk composition better, and not just better as we know it today, but even engineering cows to produce milk that carries certain hormones or certain um, pharmaceuticals is really around the corner. And that means a completely different way also of looking at animals than before. Um, methane emissions from animals, or even a very complex one also, social behavior, uh, all those traits can now be redefined based on what we know of the genome. And it's not only true for, crop, for animals, it's also, of course, for crops. If we look at plants, um, we still want, in those cases where we want to reduce the yield gap, actually um, improve the response of plants to stress. But we also want to look at very complex interactions between pathogens and, for example, I'll show to you in a potato in a minute, or in um, diseases like Panama disease or, or Black Cicatoga in banana, where we really have to look at completely new ways of interactions between different types of species. 
The most interesting one, the one you know about, for example, if we think about golden rice, is improving nutritional value thinking about iron, about vitamins, but even beyond that, perhaps of all kinds of hormones that can be produced by plants. And then what genet the genetic revolution really does is speeding up the selection process. So where in the past you had to go through painstaking generation after generation, and it could take 20, 30, 40 years before you had the result, we can sometimes now do it within a season or two. Now, one most exciting frontier that I want to talk to you about is how we can get better performance. This is about moving the maximum yield even higher. As you probably know, there are two types of grasses that man has used so far. Tropical grasses like maize and temperate grasses like wheat and rice. And tropical grasses actually have a different system of photosynthesis. And as you see, the top curve is the, what we call the C4 grasses. We are now able to identify the kinds of genes that determine that C4 response to photosynthesis. And those of you who know that photosynthesis is extremely um, uh, inefficient still, biologically speaking, this is a tremendous step forward. If we can make temperate grasses, rice for example, behave like maize in terms of uh, light interception, we're really doing something phenomenal. Now, another thing I want to talk to you, to you about is potato. Potato suffers from uh, all kinds of diseases, particularly Phytophthora potato famine. And what we see with potato now is a completely new way of looking at the interaction with the pathogen. Here, we can actually, the, the pathogen exudes a kind of um, a protein that fo that plant doesn't recognize. And the plant that does not recognize, if in the left-hand bottom, actually gets diseased. If we can work with the genes of the Phytophthora, in the plant, and we take some of that resistance from other wild potato, so this is not genetic modification, but what we call cisgenesis, the plant actually rec recognizes the Phytophthora. And why is that important? Because it's a continuous rat race between the plant and the pathogen. And here we can actually break that rat race, and it means 80% less spraying. Now, we know, of course, that a lot of discussion is about GM, genetic modification. But in fact, new genetics is a toolbox, and it's a toolbox that helps us to unravel the genome altogether. That means, for example, that advances in tomato, or sorry, advances in tomato actually allow us to understand better how the banana reacts to diseases. It also means that we need to understand and discuss in a dialogue what we're talking about when we say GMOs. There is a a real concern, I know in this country, in many uh, highly educated countries, that genetics is something dangerous. And what we need to understand is that there is a whole tradition of man interfering with the genome of plants. The only difference today is that we do it in a far more focused way, far more precisely than we did in the past. And no, it is not such that new genetics automatically needs to genetically modified organisms. On the contrary, the greatest perspective is in using genetics as a toolbox. But what we need to do is to engage in a dialogue with society. And a dialogue is also about the role of science, about the loss of authority sometimes in science, but particularly about what science means for today. There are other issues when it comes to modern genetics, and I think you have to medicine as well. Intellectual property rights. What should remain in the public domain? How can poor farmers access these new innovations? What is the safety issue, both for humans, for animals, maybe also for other pathogens in the environment? There is very little evidence today that genetic modification as such has any effect, on, nor on the environment, nor on humans or animal health. But let me stress this, the absence of proof is not a proof of the country. So we should continue to monitor safety issues because this is about it, not about laboratory situations, not about individual patients. This is about large scale applications. So public information and monitoring are extremely important. In the end, what is the genetic revolution about? It's about increasing that what is already going well. There is concern in some areas that actually yields will level off. That is not the case. Yields will continue to grow 
to a certain biological maximum. And as I showed to you, there are ways in which we can move some of that biological maximum, for example, to getting better photosynthesis response. So yes, we are moving forward. And yes, my positive message to you all is we can feed those two billion extra people, even with better quality food. But we need to do more. It's not an automatic thing. We need better characterization and focus in our genetic work to get those genotype environment interactions on an optimal level. Also, genetics can help to uh, do something which we often call embryo retrieval or embryo uh, rescue, where we can use the knowledge that we have to actually uh, find rare species and let them survive. Cisgenesis, I already talked about in potato, that's using wild relatives, not producing necessarily genetic modification. And then I think the most important, exciting thing is we can use new species for food quality and food processing. Some of the enzymes you are using, when we are using when you drink uh, soft drinks, for example, actually come already from genetic modification. But more interestingly, they may come from bacteria and algae in the future. There is an enormous potential for us to move to a bio-based economy using the knowledge that we have on genetics, extending our understanding of genetics to other species than our traditional plant and animal species. And that is a real promise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as you'll see, one of the panels this afternoon is going to consider the future of human evolution. And in anticipation of that, I'm uh, pleased to say we have Juan Enriquez with us, who is an author and managing director of Excel Venture Management based in Boston in the US. And he's going to give a talk which I suspect might be somewhat provocative, suggesting that humans are now beginning to direct their own evolution. So please join me in welcoming Juan Enriquez. So this is a preview on the first public preview of a new book that will be published in 10 days. And I'm just going to talk about the first chapter, dealing with this nice gentleman who discovered that life evolves. This is the first page on which he discovered that and thought about it, which is why it says, I think. And he discovered that life evolves according to two principles. The first is natural selection. And you've seen that in terms of survival of the fittest. And of course, the second principle is random mutation. So random mutation occurs precisely randomly, which is why you can have cats with 23 toes, and you can have humans with six fingers. But of course, because mutation is random, sometimes six fingers isn't a bad thing. So for instance, Alfonso Alfonseca, who's otherwise known as the octopus, has six fingers, six toes, and was the relief pitcher of the year in 2000 because of this mutation. So one of the things that's been driving evolution is the change in predators, in food, in microbes, in the environment, in the population, in domestication, in exercise or labor. And the question I'd like to ask you is, do you think any of these things have been changing over the past century for humans, for animals, for plants, and for microbes. And if you dropped Charles Darwin, just as a thought experiment, into the middle of Trafalgar Square, he would recognize most of these buildings. But would he recognize the people? Because as he looks around in his traditional careful way, he would notice that people have gotten quite a lot larger. He will also notice that house cats have gotten larger. And the strange thing is, wild animals have gotten larger as well. So what have we done to the environment that leads at least 12 species, wild and not wild, to get fat? I can understand why humans with too many Twinkies and too much television, but why wild horses that are eating grass? He'd also notice that the situation for most people is that they're far weaker because we've moved from a species that used to work all day in labor into an office species that has been largely domesticated. He would also take note and say, 
People are an awful lot older, but the interesting thing is the old are a lot fitter. They're now running marathons. So as he tabulates this, he would find changes that in most animals would lead to the conclusion, this might be a different species. And the question then would be, would he write the same books? And of course, as he thinks about, is this a new species? He'd take a look at some of the current examples. And he would have to wonder, is it rapidly mutating? <laughs> Which is perfectly possible. It's not just the morphology of human beings that's changing, so too are the absolute basic drivers of evolution. And let me give you a couple of examples. For the four billion years that life has been on this planet, nature drove the show. And it drove it according to two laws that reinforced each other, natural selection and random mutation. But over the last century, humans have come to run half the show. And they're driving it, and they're driving evolution with two very different principles. They're driving it with unnatural selection, and they're driving it with non-random mutation. Much of what you've seen today, and many of the Nobel Prizes given over the past few decades, have been precisely for technologies that enable non-random mutation. Let's take the first of these concepts, the unnatural selection part. This is what unnatural selection looks like. This is not the way that animals gather. These are not the animals that typically gather. And this is not what nature looks like unless if you gather animals on a large scale. This is not what nature looks like. We have decided that we are going to put our corn here, our rice here, our wheat here, and that is an example of unnatural selection. Our rural landscape looks nothing like what nature would have it look like. You, it's not just that we're changing what nature looks like, we're changing the concept of nature itself. So when you take wild mustard weed and you suppress the mustard flowers, then you get broccoli. When you take bigger leaves in wild mustard, then you get kale. When you sterilize mustard flowers and you do it deliberately, then you get cauliflower. So this deliberate engineering is also occurring in a creature, in a species, that is driving itself from a rural species to an urban species very, very quickly. This very rapid urbanization has taken place over less than a century. And just to give you an order of magnitude on this, China used about 150% more cement in three years than the United States did in one century. That is why we're living in ever tighter cities, in ever smaller apartments. And to do that, we've had to domesticate our pets. Our pets no longer run wild, and our pets have to deal with species that normally they don't deal with in peace. And by the way, we've also had to domesticate humans. This is what human domestication looks like, and it's been as effective as the way we've domesticated wild wolves into dogs. So if you look at the incidence of violence in human societies pre-states, it was absolutely massive, even compared to past centuries where there was quite a bit more violence than there is today. This is what violence used to look like when it was sanctioned by the state. So on Saturdays or on Sundays, you would have public executions, and the idea was to make it hurt as much as possible to entertain everybody. But over the course of the past hundreds of years, we've seen a steady decline in violence, in homicides, in murders. We no longer accept slavery, and we think behavior like this is absolutely savage, and that's been part of our process of domestication. This is a continuing and accelerating trend where we have ever fewer murders, violent crimes in a whole series of countries. And yes, there are exceptions. Yes, there are regions of the world where these things are not taking place. But on the whole, we are a far more peaceful domesticated species. We've also been able to generate wealth in a way that we have never conceived of in the history of the human species. So more people are now obese that are malnourished. And nature, that all-powerful mother 
that all-powerful determinant of what lives and dies, for humans has become a much smaller nature. And you can see many examples of this. You can see it in how many people are killed decade by decade by extreme weather events. Not because we have less hurricanes, not because we have less volcanoes, not because we have less tornadoes, but because we've gotten better at predicting them, at building our shelters, at anticipating it, and it's all a part of a process of the domestication of nature. But this unnatural selection is not the most powerful instrument of evolution. The most powerful instrument of evolution is the non-random mutation part, and that's what's going to change humanity and life on Earth in a fundamental way. That, of course, begins to appear with Berg, Boyer, and Cohen, and with many of those in this room. And what these people have done is they've taken a process which is a random process and they've made it a directed process. The non-random mutation has become an intelligent design for very specific purposes. I would like the seeds to do this, I'd like the plants to do this, I'd like the animal to do this, and I'd like to cure this disease or promote this trait in a human being. This engineering is reaching some pretty extraordinary conclusions. This is the first programmable cell where you can insert the entire gene code into a cell and program it. And we're using this cell to make animal feed. We're using it to make chemicals. We're using it to humanize pig organs to make different organs that can be transplanted into humans. We're using it to store information. We are going to build a very large company out of this discovery. CRISPR, a technology that you're gonna hear an awful lot more about, was discovered in yogurt but it's become a Lego-like way of moving very, very large blocks of genes systematically from one place to another. And as CRISPR spreads, and you will hear a lot more about CRISPR over the next five years, you have a complete discontinuity in this random mutation of evolution. Drew Endy explains this in the following way. So if you think of evolution in a traditional way, a creature is born with no eyes, develops one eye, tries two eyes, goes back to one eye, decides two eyes is better, and then starts developing other features. It's a random process. These natural living systems have been altered because now we've decided two eyes is a good thing, so let's keep it right there. Let's sequence that. Let's take that sequence, insert it into a synthesized life form, maintain two eyes, and we accelerate evolution in a deliberate way. That is a very, very different way of running evolution, in fact, it's the opposite logic to what Darwin mapped. As you think of these consequences, this is now coming to high schools, and it's coming to children, and it's coming to colleges. This is not just Nobel Prize winners that are playing with these technologies. For $150, you can enter a lab, have your PCR, have your synthesis machines, and begin to play with these technologies, which is why you have the international genetically engineered machine competition every year at MIT with thousands of youth. The implication of all this is that humans are directly and deliberately taking control of their own evolution and the evolution of many animals and the evolution of plants and the evolution of diseases. In fact, we've decided to drive certain diseases to extinction. As you think about these things, you have to think about the technologies and the implications of the technologies that we are putting into the hands of our own species. Because there are decades where nothing happens, and then there are weeks where decades happen. And we're seeing many examples of this, one of which occurred within the past year. So for four billion years, there were four letters, one code, that got a Nobel Prize that drove all life on this planet. Everything was made out of the four base pairs of DNA. But as of the last year, in part due to Japanese research and research in other parts of the world, we can now insert different chemicals that reproduce in animals. That means we can create an entirely parallel system of life, a parallel tree of life, run evolution in a different way, potentially build plants that are immune to viruses, potentially burnt, build animals that are immune to bacteria, and run a completely parallel evolutionary language. So here's the closing question. 
If we are going to redesign bacteria, viruses, plants, animals, humans to our purposes, what do we want people to find in 100,000 years? What are we going to do with these extraordinary powers? And that is chapter one of this book. Thank you very much. So Nobel laureates are busy people. But I think all Nobel laureates would agree that the year immediately following the award of the Nobel Prize is the busiest of their lives. And so getting even 10 minutes with a new Nobel laureate is always a great achievement. Hence, I'm delighted to announce that we, have now, we are now going to have a talk from Hiroshi Amano, one of the 2014 Nobel laureates in physics, in which he will describe his invention, the LED. Please well, join me in welcoming Hiroshi Amano. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, Nobel Foundation and uh, also the JSBS for giving me this opportunity. Uh, first, uh, I have to apologize two things. One, uh, maybe someone are very hungry <laughs> before the lunch. <laughs> I'm also hungry. <laughs> and the second, uh, the topics. I'd like to explain today is quite different from the other speakers. But taking 10 minutes, uh, I'd like to explain that the LEDs can be used not only as the tools for saving energy of the lightings, but also it can be used for the tools of medical applications. Uh, in 1993s, uh, first, blue LEDs uh, have been commercialized by the contribution of Japanese academia and also the Japanese companies. Then, uh, full-color smart displays composed of blue LEDs with red and green LEDs have been uh, utilized in the smartphones and the cellular phones, and also the TV systems. And in 1999, there's some uh, engineers recognized that, okay, I have some tools for that. Uh, the, this is the uh, blue LEDs, but combining these blue LEDs with phosphorus, we, we, we can realize the white LEDs, okay? <laughs> this is blue and this is white. So by which we can uh, use these white LEDs to the general lighting systems. So I'd like to explain how we can save energy by using these white LEDs. Oh, okay. Uh, these systems, it's very simple and easy to use. So we can uh, support, or we can provide this system to the people, especially the younger generation who lives in the area uh, at which uh, they cannot access to the electricity. Uh, for example, Africa, uh, Middle uh, Asia and uh, Southeast Asia. So we are very happy to supply uh, this system uh, to the younger generation for reading books and uh, study at night. Okay. Maybe many of you know that uh, there are 48 uh, nuclear power plants in Japan. But now, all the power plants stopped now. So before 2011, about 30% of the electricity was generated by nuclear power plants. But now, all the power plants stopped now in Japan. So we have to find a way of adapting this 30% electricity. 
the some Japanese uh, database company predicts that by year 2020, uh, over 70% of the general lighting will be replaced to the LED lighting system, by which we can save energy of 7% of the total electricity. Okay? So uh, we can save about a quarter of the electricity by using the LED lighting system. Okay, next, uh, I'd like to explain the, this LED system can be used not only for uh, energy savings, but also for medical applications. Okay. Uh, Nangwe University team, the School of Science, succeeded in synthesizing the protein, the uh, photoresponsivity of which can be controlled. For example, the some protein is active in the blue light and some protein is active in the orange light. By using this protein with the very tiny LED systems. The Washington University team and the University of Illinois team succeeded in controlling the activity of animals by inserting the proteins and also the tiny LEDs. Okay? For example, we can control the sleeping or high activity of animals by switching on and off the blue light LEDs or <laughs> orange LEDs, which might be applicable to treat the, uh, for example, Parkinson's disease or the Alzheimer's disease. And the wavelengths of LEDs is not now limited to the visible range. We can fabricate even the UV or deep UV LEDs by which we can apply this technology, for example, to the skin disease treatment. Uh, with the collaboration of uh, Nagoya City University, we develop a new skin disease treatment system based on the UV and deep UV LEDs. Uh, these are the matrix, matrix of um, uh, deep UV LEDs. So by which we can control very precisely only the, uh, the skin disease area. And the advantage of using this system is uh, in conventional ramp systems, it emits not only the DPV light, but also the infrared light. So the skin temperature becomes high. So it sometimes becomes very dangerous. But in case of uh, DPV LEDs, it can only emit the DPV light, no other emissions. So uh, we can precisely irradiate the diseased area, and by, uh, we can treat, for example, atopy and so on. Okay. So I, I'm not specialist, but I heard that uh, LEDs have been already used for tools for gene analysis, but I do believe that we can use the LED technology or tools for gene manipulation very safely, and we need the information what the uh, medical scientists need as a tools, maybe we can provide, or we do our best 
to prepare the tools for treating the diseases. So we sincerely hope that medical and engineering cooperation uh, proceed and uh, realize the future uh, technology to treat any kind of diseases. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed, Professor Amano. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the close of the morning session, and I'd like you all please just to join me in a round of applause for all our morning speakers and panelists. Thank you. And now Ms. Hashimoto has a housekeeping announcement. Thank you. Uh, allow me to speak in Japanese first. Uh, ランチブレイクに入りますけども、その前にいくつかお知らせをさせていただきたいと思います。まず、あの、ホープミーティングのご参加者の方ですが、あと、パネリストの方々、スペシャルゲストの皆様、そしてホープの参加者の方々はですね、この後ご予定がございますので、まずお立ちになりまして、次の会場へとご移動をお願いいたします。スタッフが誘導させていただきますので、ご移動をお願いできますでしょうか。So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're asking the, um, the HOPE meeting participants to move out of the venue, first of all. So to the panelists, special guests, and others taking part in the HOPE meeting, please follow our staff members. Uh, they will guide you out of this hall uh, to your next venue. Thank you. <laughs>